Welcome to the Not Sequitur Show. Yes, I know it's been, it's been a few weeks. Sorry. A lot of stuff's been happening. A lot of stuff been going on, but uh, I think I'm going to be redeeming myself today because I've got a really interesting guest that came to me by way of Floyd FP. If you guys remember Floyd FP, he's a philosophy friend of mine, and he was like, dude, I just want to have a cool conversation with this guy, and you really got to check it out. I can't do a Floyd invitation, sorry. But uh, he's reach out to him. He's really cool. He, he's a preceptor and a young creationist. Don't know much else about him because I really didn't really want it to. I wanted to interview him my style and, and kind of feel for his uh, presuppositional apologetics because people know I have a uh, kind of an interest in that. But anyways, let me introduce him to you. I, do, do you want to go by Gospelonian? Is, is that how you say Gospelonian? It's a uh, Gospelogian, but no, just Gospelogian. Joke. Just Joe's good, man. Hi, right, Joe. Not Joe for Joseph, Gospel Ocean. But anyways, Joe, so I was watching some of your stuff. And let's dive into that real quick because first, uh, people are already asking questions about you, man. First of all, somebody's commenting on your beard. That that beard is majestic. Thank you. That, Thank that you. beard is majestic. I don't know why anybody would diss you on that. That's, that's just gorgeous. I had a long beard, too, but a long time ago. But people were asking because you do apolog- apologetics and you do a young creationism, but sure. they want to know you're not a flat earther and you're not a sovereign citizen, right? What is citizen? Sovereign. Don't know what that is. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my, my. I've heard of that. <laughs> oh, dude, that's a rabbit hole. You haven't been down, I take it then. Uh, I, maybe I'm familiar with it, but not by that name. Explain to me what a sovereign citizen is. Real all right, let me make sure everybody can hear. Everybody. It looks everything's fine on my end, but make sure the chat can hear all this before we get too far into this. It looks good. Sovereign citizens are basically people that think that the government, when they were born, started up some kind of weird account for them that separated them from their corporate name. Therefore, they're not obligated to pay taxes or pay laws, driver's license. And so when they always get stopped in like a traffic stop, they always run this maritime law thing and this bizarre stuff that was from oh, like this 18th I've century. Seen the maritime law and the driver's license and Blake's yeah, and stuff. Okay. That's sovereign citizen. Okay. Yeah. So, no, I, no. I, I saw one of those one time and I was like, this is a good argument. Like he was using with the cop. And the fact that he knew the law better than the cops did is that's always enjoyable. But cops aren't lawyers. People don't remember that, but whatever. Sometimes. Yeah. No, there are times where I like where the guy knows her rights, constitutional rights, but the sovereign yeah. citizen is just bunk. Um, yeah. Yeah. I used to check it out when you get a chance. So what's funny is you're you're seeing me as a presuppositionalist and a young earth creationist and like I didn't, I didn't, I don't know I didn't ask for any of that I <laughs> seen your yeah. videos yes you did <laughs> okay but here's the thing man I was just like YouTubing and I'm like a Christian making YouTube videos for the Christians and one day I make this video how to witness to an atheist and Godless Engineer gets a hold of it and rips me to ribbons takes my five minute video and turns it into an hour part and I'm just like whoa and I was like listen dude it's all fun to be brave but if you want to do this conversation real time let's do it and yeah he was like bro here's the link let's well, do it let me, okay you don't know the backstory my audience does so this is going to be old news for them but god engineer used to be a co-host on this particular channel with me and my former right. co-host he was one of the biggest idiots i've ever met in my entire life yeah okay. and he was running a narrative that i had committed fraud that i had committed medical fraud he was just making stuff up about me in order to facilitate the taking over this channel and stealing money from me from my former business partner so Wow. I have no love for that man whatsoever. He's dishonest. He's not even a real engineer. He's a software developer. He doesn't have a degree in engineering. He made it very clear when I started asking about math, and he really didn't seem to know his math very well. But, yeah, he's just a software developer. not saying that you can't be a software developer and be an actual engineer, but there was a far and few between, and he's not one of those. He's a programmer. But he is just – he's just he's horrible in his, in his philosophy. He's horrible in everything I've ever heard him pontificate upon, and he's just an a-hole. But other than that, yeah, he's an, well, his people in my audience say he's an absolute imbecile. That's basically the good way. The thing for me was once he did that and I had the debate with him, I got like five invitations. Hey, come on our show. Hey, come on our show. And I was like, come on our show. And they're like, you need to debate this. And yeah, I've been a young earth creationist for a long time, but even presuppositional apologetics, probably the first debate where I used any presuppositional apologetics was on Floyd FP's channel. And I was just doing all this apologetic stuff. And I, I learned some of it in school and read some books here and there. But I was really more on the classical side was where I was. I knew a lot more about classical apologetics. And then I realized that classical apologetics just do not hold up in the modern landscape at all. You can't everybody. There's answers to all these old questions. And with whichever side you land on it, it's been over, over conversed. It's just done. And so that's when I turned to presuppositional apologetics because I'm like, all right, I I still think there's some conversation to be had here that doesn't exist in classical apologetics. And so then I started, I've 
read half of one book on presuppositional apologetics. Yeah, these are labels that you, you have for me, and and I'm I'm cool with them. But I didn't start out looking to be that guy. No, that's, fair. that's fair. No, that's fair. Right, look, here I am. I'm a big fan of Floyd FP. I really am. I think he's really good at understanding the topics way better than I can ever be. I learned from him back in the day, way back. It was him, it was myself, a guy named Ozzy, and a few other people that were challenging presuppositional apologetics when they came around. Because, as you mentioned, there's probably a few forms, I would say, apologetics. You've got presuppositional, you've got classical, then I would probably say evidential. Evidential, yeah. Yeah, so those are probably the three main categories of presuppositional argumentation. And I do think that you're right. Classical presuppositionalism has been around or classical apologetics have been around for a very long time obviously you go back to the Aquinas, thomas aquinas you go back to blaise pascal you go back to augusta de hippo anselm these are all more the classical type approaches because they're trying to argue by using a reason that some god exists but the van tilts the bonsons came around and they're like and the clark came going to say hey look we don't have to argue for god we're just going to presuppose he exists and then go from there I think even more, which is the driving force for me, is biblically, God never provides evidence for his existence, and he doesn't provide philosophical arguments for existence. And that's where classical and evidentialism live. I think if you look at the Bible, it presupposes God's existence. And I think the most biblical way to argue for this, which is going to be my biggest concern, is am I doing it biblically? The most biblical way to argue is presup. And that's why I switched over to is I'm like, hey, Okay, if you like go in there and you're like, all right, in the Bible, where does it say this is a proof that God exists? No, I it look, I, I don't even take umbrage yeah. with that. I think the Bible does presuppose yeah. God. It, God, yeah. the Bible isn't written for somebody to be convinced God exists. Uh, the no, Bible's not written at all. as a as a. And by the way, you you do know I'm a non-believer, right? Oh yeah, I figured that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm a big above yeah. board. Let's just put all the cards on yeah. the table. Let's yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, 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 people, people know my history. I am mentioned in the Journal of Creation. I am mentioned in Talk Origin. I am mentioned in Wikipedia. I I'm like legit against younger creationism i go way back with many of them although i'm still friends look are you familiar with dr safadi uh nope john donathan safadi he's real big in the precepts real big in the younger creationists oh. yeah okay so anyways i'm really good friends with him but i've also had ken hoven on the channel many times who i just don't do not agree with on anything but wow. I, my name's out there when it comes to creationism kent yeah yeah his wife is a friend of mine cindy she's been on many times uh, so I, my name's well familiarized in the younger creationist circles. Not so much in the precepts, even though I prefer to do philosophy than I do any kind of a counter apologetics or anything like that. That's really not my shtick. I am familiar with the arguments, which we'll talk about a little bit, but I do agree with you, like I said, that the Bible is presupposing God. Now, I watched your discussion with Floyd, Floyd and I thought you made some really good points. I think he did too. But for the audience, can you basically, what you think is precept as far as like, the I, I assume you go to more Van Til. I've never read Van Til, so I don't really know. Okay. I need to. He's on my list, but it's, I got a lot of things. You sound yeah. like a Von Tillian only from my, the discussion you had, because Von Tillian kind of argued that in order to even apprehend anything, if you know, to have any kind of reason, you have to have some kind of grounding, which is going to be God. Without God, you can't even argue anything. You can't have any kind of knowledge or anything. And he, that's his presuppositional style. Clark went to more of a argument style that why you should have a, a presup God instead of an evidential guard God. But, I mean, from your standpoint— like you said, you don't think the Bible is there to argue God. So why is it that you want to go to a precept to say, look, we should just assume God exists? Yeah, I think for me, the biblical argument. So one of the one of the stories in the Bible where you see this played out the most is the story of Job. And Job has more reason than anybody else to say, why me? And for anybody that hasn't familiarized themselves with the story of Job, the devil goes to God and God and Satan basically have a bet. And Satan says, if you take away everything this guy's got, he's not going to be so great anymore. And the Bible says he's perfect and upright man. And so pretty soon his kids get wiped out, his farms, his house, all this stuff. And at the end, like God actually answers Job in his distress. And God's answer to Job about why all this was happening and what had gone wrong, God doesn't tell Job anything. He just says, where were you when I made the earth? Where were you when I did all this stuff? I've got all this power and all this might. Who are you to even question me? And Job's, whoa, I am sorry. You are right. You're God. I'm not. I'm done. And I think that's the time in the Bible when we see that God's way of answering man's questions, God refused to put himself in judgment to be judged by man. He, he refuses to step out of the judge's chair and put himself in court. In fact, what he does is he reasserts, I am the judge. You are in my court. You will not you, you won't get to do that. That's not your place. You are man. I am God. I'm not playing that game. God refused to let man judge him. And so I think precept leans the hardest with, no, you don't get to judge God. We presuppose he exists. And for you to argue against him, you're going to have to borrow from his own arguments. And that's the vein that 
I see biblically with priests up, which is why I go that route. Now, I need to read more. You probably know more about this than I do. Uh, you've read Van Til, and I have it. So there you go. And but for me, I see that, and I'm like, that's the biblical track. So I'm really more of a preacher and a pastor than I am an apologist, but I believe that Christians should be willing to provide a defense for their faith. So here we are. But I think your summation of Job is, is good. Uh, I would avoid, by the way, Bonson. If you do want to read more, read Van Tiller Clark, but Bonson is basically, his whole view was just basically empty rhetoric. His whole thing on presuppositional argumentation was to, quote, shut the mouth of the non-believer. That's exactly what he was trying to do. It was just, it was just confusion. Which is okay. not, it, yeah, so he just wanted to confuse atheists. And by the way, a lot of people that talk about these subjects don't really get into the nuances of the topics. And so when you run across a preceptor, not you specifically by any means, but general, generally when preceptors first came around, they were really confusing people because people didn't understand epistemology, they didn't understand philosophy, and they didn't even know how to refute the arguments. And some of the arguments, the counter arguments to precept was really bad. Seriously, there's still, I run a blog uh, that I, I explain to atheists bad arguments, right? Yeah. I still be using these arguments. They're just bad. And why? But as far as like Job, isn't this, isn't Satan the great Satan? He was supposed to be the one prosecuting man, right? And when he went to God and said, hey, this is your faithful servant, I could break him and kill his, his family, give him boils. And God's like, okay, let's do this, right? Let's test this guy. Which, by the way, from a morality standpoint, I find to be highly questionable. If you're a God, first of all, you already know the outcome of something. And sure. why, why would you punish somebody for being a believer just because you want to have some kind of dick measuring size, so to speak, with Satan? And he already knows what's going to happen. And by the way, he's corresponding with Satan, right? He's like, hey, dude, hey, how you been? I, I know it's been a while. And, he, and have this bet with him, which the whole story seems to be odd doesn't doesn't seriously just if you brought up job doesn't it seem like odd that god and satan are gonna sit there and go hey yeah let's just test this guy and make his life miserable i think hey first of all the purposes of god are god's purposes and so we can only speculate so far as we can speculate but i think it does a number of things uh for christians number one it shows that satan was not allowed to do anything to job that god didn't allow him first yeah and that's true and by the way real quick god did it bring up yeah god went to satan on it yeah for whatever reason yeah and so that's a comfort for anybody in a trial that's a believer because they're like hey maybe the devil's doing all this but god had to say yes for that to happen so clearly god's still in control so it shows god's sovereignty over satan but it also shows the i, I think part of the reason people have trouble in these debates is they don't realize how big the Christian God claims to actually be. If you actually look at the attributes of God and who he claims to be, and even modern veins of Christianity are constantly shrinking God to their level. And if we understand how big God is and how minute man is, then we stop being upset by, okay, why did God let Job's life have some misery in it? And we start sitting there and we wonder, wait a minute, Job actually wasn't, he's still a sinner. He's still made out of flesh. Why, why did God bless him in the first place? We start asking, we're asking the wrong questions a lot of time when it comes to why did God do such and such? And I think it's because we have a small view of God. God is the creator. He can do with his creation as he pleases for his glory. And when we have a correct mindset, we are happy with however God chooses to use us as long as it glorifies him, because that's my highest accomplishment as a being, as a creative being is to bring glory to my creator. So by, by the way, are you familiar with Saiten Bruniket? No. You don't what know Saiten? Saiten Bruniket. Oh, he was. Saiten is famous for presuppositional apologetics. And, okay. Um, you know a lot more about this. Than oh, I, I know. Do. Yeah, I know Sai pretty well. We go. We are okay. actually. I consider Sai a friend. We don't agree on anything. <laughs> we really don't. We don't agree on precept. We don't agree on philosophy. We don't agree on epistemology. We don't agree on biology. We don't agree on science. But I happen to the guy. I'm not going to front. I'm not going to. I just something about sure. him. We just get along. It is what it is, right? P people think that if sure. somebody disagrees with you, they have a completely different worldview. You have to dislike them. You have to hate them. And this is not the case. The guy is actually a pretty cool guy. But he well, is, and you he's get, known you get for sharpen your beliefs by surrounding yourself with people that don't agree with you. It's actually good for you and good for them. Oh, yeah. People It'd be boring if everybody agreed, especially with people like Saitan. I think his precept, his precept is very antagonistic to say the least very uh very empty rhetoric but he knows it he knows it. he just wants to piss off atheists that's all he's done that's all he does okay but yeah but he's friends with uh ken and what's it eric hoven who's been on a couple times i've had him on a, a few times years ago eric hoven but uh, but anyway going back to the whole job and go back to the priest stuff my my view is that when it comes to the precept piece up argument that they seem to, for some reason to believe that because they precept that God exists, and even if Satan and God had this weird 
battle to see if their ser- his servant was going to forsake him or not. Basically, they, I guess they were kind of arguing if he was going to lash out against God, right, or forsake him and, and, and turn his back to God, which didn't happen. But the precepts say that, look, without any kind of divine being, we're talking about a maximally great being. We're talking about a being that has all the God-making properties, the omni-God, so to speak, omnibenevolent, omniscient, omnipotent. And so they believe, and I'm going to ask if, if this is your position, that even an atheist, or I'm not an atheist, by the way, I'm a non-believer, but I'm not an atheist. There is a difference. This has been well established. I know I have a few holdouts, but God is engineer doesn't grasp that. He doesn't understand atheism because he's an idiot. Um, but I'm a non-believer, but not an atheist. I'm an agnostic. Okay. But do you believe that a non-believer somehow has to deep down hold that there must be a God or believe there's a God or know there's a God or have to borrow from any kind of presuppositional argumentation to even start begin to use things like logic and reason? Because I, I do a little bit with logic. I've written a, a paper on a refutation of Anthony Flew's work on presumption of atheism, and I used a little bit of logic. So would you argue that as somebody who knows a little bit basic logic, I had to borrow from the Christian view? Because that's what Saiten argues. That's his argument for precept. Most, I, I found that atheism, evolution, naturalism, and humanism all go hand in hand. You really, they're, they're an unbreakable chain. To find an atheist who's not an evolutionist is pretty darn hard to do. Um, so these I, I, agree, things all, I agree with that. Yeah, I so mean, these things yeah, all sure. are going to go together. And I think the linchpin in that argument is that naturalism, and the scientific standard by which atheists impose upon God, we can't study him, we need evidence, give us more evidence, and they don't like the evidence that's given them. But the problem that happens there is they cannot provide the same evidence they demand for God, they cannot provide for logic, and yet they completely admit logic is true. You cannot provide any more evidence for logic than you can provide for God, and yet we assume one's true and not the other. So I think that's a great place of conversation for the precept guys, especially when you're dealing with a naturalistic guy who believes in evolution is to say, all right, so using your scientific theory, you've got to prove that you can use that logic before you say it. That's the same you're telling me that I have to prove my God exists. Yeah. So I think that's the linchpin of that argument. But I, I think the easy defeater to that is this one, don't subscribe to scientism. And I know that if people like Gala Janir does, I think scientism is a very poor way to approach epistemology. I do think that science is the best way to study the natural world. And that's why it, it holds to what's called methodological naturalism. It doesn't, sure. it doesn't hold to ontological or philosophical naturalism. But it's just assumed that, that if you have a natural phenomenon, we're going to come up with a natural explanation for it. So it's a form of naturalism, but it's not a, the strongest form, which would be ontological. There's nothing in the non-natural set. So you have a natural set and then the complementary set, which would be the non-natural set, which I just call supernatural because it's just easy convenience. But yeah, science starts science is prohibited, has always been prohibited by non-overlapping magisteria to addressing the God claim. So I think when an atheist says, hey, look, prove your God by science, they have a category error. Absolutely category error. And also I also argue that if an if a theist isn't arguing that he can prove God exists, then you're strawmanning him by asking him to prove something because that's not his claim. I believe exactly. God is true. It's not the same as I can claim God is true. Those are vastly different exactly. claims. Yeah, exactly. Once us, well, and the nice that. thing, and, and I'm picking this up right now, and so I think for anybody that might be watching, one of the one of the differences here too is what you and I are doing is different than what I did with several of my other people. And what you and I are doing is we are discussing the arguments together. I'm not debating you as a person Correct. right now. Correct. Uh, and a lot of times what happens is it is one person debating another person, and then they use these arguments and go at it like this. And I think there's a difference between that and discussing what are the arguments and how do they work and how do we view them. Yeah, absolutely. Dave Della for $5. Uh, Super chat. Thank you, Dave. I hope all is well with you, man. It's been a while. He says, Steve is not an atheist. Yes. <laughs> and it's so funny, man. I get into um, the biggest arguments with people in my own so-called tribe because they're like, you don't believe you're an atheist. I'm like, study philosophy. Yeah, take a basic course in philosophy. You don't know what you're talking about. I have proven numerous times. I've written a lot of things on this particular topic. But yeah, so I don't believe I'm not an atheist because I don't hold there are no gods. What I hold is that there's just so much about reality that we're just probably can never apprehend that's outside of our epistemic understanding that due to biological and physiological limitations that sure there could be some kind of divine thing do i think that people know what that divine thing would be if it exists no i think christianity is wrong um i think that muslim is, islam is wrong i think that all religions are false but i do not hold the position that there can't be a god and what that god is who the heck knows right but so in that okay. story, yeah, me trying to argue the logic sure. claim against you sure. would be stupid. 
because you've already moved past that. You're already in a place where you're like, hey, I'm not claiming that immaterial truths can't exist. Yeah, I and believe that, that they do. I, 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 yeah. I'm moving toward, I'm moving away from nominalism to what's called platonic realism or okay. mathematical platonism. And there's some reasons for that. And it's mostly for convenience. If you read Quine's indispensability thesis, he basically argues that in order to use logic and mathematics and science, there has to be some tangibility to it. There has to be some existence to it or just these arguments don't work. And I think that actually makes some sense. It doesn't mean that, that oh, like X equals X, the law of identity for all of X equals X. It uh, The preceptor usually comes in, and I've talked to many, and you're, I don't think you're in this category, but they believe in some kind of idealism that for A, if all of X equals X to be true at all times and all places, there must be a mind that exists at all times and all places to, to actually have that equality be, be true, be necessary in all possible worlds. But the defeater to that is, even if there was no mind, even if there was, if all of reality ceased to exist for all practical purposes, or the universe ends up in some kind of uh, big black hole state, just a high degree of entropy, the laws of logic, the what we understand to be true, would still be true, just nobody would there be to know it. it would, we wouldn't have any minds to apprehend it, but if their mind came along, they could still discover something like that. So it still holds true. Sure. And one of the things is, I don't mind discussing that, but I don't come into this with a formula and a lot of preceptors do. They come into this with their formula. This is how I argue. This is where I start. And usually logic and morality are going to be the two big ones out of the canon right there at the gate. We're going to start there. And they really are. <laughs> they really are. Come at this. Most of the atheists come in with their problem of evil. Here we go. And everybody comes in with their canon and their systems and they do the thing. And I'm not there. It's really funny. So I didn't realize this till one of my recent debates, I'm like, wait, I don't have a file of index cards to read off my pet argument against you to use it. Cause I'm like, where, how are you keeping track of all these details? And I'm like, I've been doing this oh, 10 years, got, man. Like, I, 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 I've been doing this a decade. So it's not much yeah. I haven't heard. I got right. on Pine Creek show yeah. and he's, oh yeah, shuffle to this argument. Oh yeah, he did that. So I go to this argument. I'm like, oh, okay, that's what you're doing. I thought we were having a conversation, bro. <laughs> okay. I'm, I, I'm, I, I don't have anything against Pine Creek. He, he, we know each other quite. We, I don't think he's ever been on my show. We know of each other. He ribs me every so often and I may have poked at him before, but I'm not a big fan of his style. I think it's, or I'll, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just, I, I, I certain conversations I like more than others. Like I loved your conversation with Floyd. I thought that was amazing. Both you guys were trying to have a dialectic where you can, he can explain his point of view. You can explain your point of view and have this natural synthesis between them, which I thought was very informative. Uh, it wasn't argumentative. It wasn't antagonistic. And like you said, people weren't coming in with these massive cannons. Oh, how do you explain the evidential problem evil? It's okay. Um, and you're right though. You're all right that the big two things are when it comes to, Actually, I say these are three. There's logic, dealing with logic, with most atheists, and I, and I don't mean to be demeaning on this, but this is from my own personal view. Most atheists do not really have a good handle on basic logical principles, at least when it comes to sentential logic. Also, uh, evolution. Evolution of biology seems to do go hand in hand with that, because for an atheist to account for life, for the diversity of life, they need some kind of explanation. And obviously, we all believe not you, but the rest of us believe that evolution does do that. And the third one, of course, is morality, which is one of the most complicated subjects in philosophy next to philosophy of mind. I think philosophy of mind is probably the hardest, but morality is a very technical, in-depth topic. And I see a lot of these types of conversations start going to morality and it's like, what, what, are, what are they even talking about? Even though I, I know a little bit about the topic, but they're so in the weeds and, they, and most of them don't understand the material. And so it's very confusing, but you're right. Those are the three things that people would just launch into. What's, what's your moral grounding? What's, you know, what, what, we'll just talk about 4 billion years of evolution. My problem is that you're dealing with people, not arguments. And so you need to talk to the person that you're talking with, not just deal with the arguments of the people. And that's where I really probably have a different approach than some other guys. Cause I'm like, yeah, maybe that's their argument. Maybe it's not, but maybe they're also a person with unique ideas. Can we figure that out first? <laughs> Let me ask you, what led you into your belief as you stand now, as far as like your Christianity, what flavor would you say that you're more like to, are you more of a Calvinist, Arminius, a Baptist? And then what kind of led you to there to get you to precept as opposed to like the classical? Cause I, most people I talk to are classical. They really are classical uh, apologists. But the precept sure. has a special place with me because, again, when precepts started coming around the Internet, I was in the forefront of all that. So I, I didn't know it was still a thing. That's why I was like, oh, I got to reach out to this guy, man. I didn't know precept was still around on the Internet. <laughs> 
Yeah, for me, I tell people all the time, Calvinism and Arminianism are words used by people that don't understand church history. If we're going to pick the crude version of the word, I will never call myself a Calvinist. But yes, I would agree with all the tenets of Calvinism, as so would the early church, as Jesus and Paul. Arminian was one of the first heretics after the Reformation. He was condemned by all the early church councils. And then now mainstream Christianity has been so diluted and people don't understand hermeneutics and how to study their Bibles. And they love these free will humanist arguments. And I'm like, guys, that's humanism. That ain't Christianity. I don't know what you're talking about over there. But yeah, I've leaned very reformed in my theology. Either God is sovereign or he's not. So okay. if you're going to say he's sovereign, just own the fact that he does things you can't defend. Straight up, Job's children. Hey, sucks that Job's children died. But I have to live with the fact that I'm not going to say it was somebody's free will choice. No, God did something that I can't defend. And sometimes he does that because well, he's God. Uh, and, and I, and in some bizarre way, I kind of respect that. Yeah, I wanted to ask you directly because I just by hearing what you were talking about, Floyd, you did come uh, more across with reformed Calvinist kind of thing. And the five, I assume five points of tulip and all that. So oh, yeah. Once gravity, an atheist yeah. figures that out, they dive into election and then tell me yeah. that it's God's fault. Well, not yeah, it comes I mean, up. It's, it's so funny, though, when anybody ever asks, are you, I, if you ask any any Calvinist, are you elected or are you reprobate? Oh, I'm elected. How do you know that? I asked. Everyone seems to get the same answer. I don't know, man. I, don't. Yeah. I, bet, I bet one Calvinist says, no, I asked and I'm a reprobate, but I'm a believe anyways. Oh, OK, let's go with that. But yeah, the whole thing with the hyper determination and God knowing where you're going to go before you, you even existed, it just seems to me. What's the point then? I don't even understand the theocracies and the, or excuse me, the theodicies that explain away the problem evil, why we're here to experience evil, why we're here to do soul building exercises. If you go to more of a Hicks type of a view, I, I, to me, there's nothing about life that's that, that to me reeks of a God. There's no sense to where, if a God exists, why would he have be having going, any of us going through of this stuff, especially if it's already predetermined what the outcome is going to be. What's the point? If you have this eternity that exists after we die, because that's basically what it is, no matter what you believe, you or I, doesn't matter. There's going to be an eternity, as far as we understand time, for all practical purposes, after we're no longer here, as opposed to this very finite 80 whatever years that most of us will end up being. And so I don't see the, the point of why an omnipotent, uh, omniscient God would want anything like that, because it's so insignificant in the big picture, and then to have it it, it, in a Calvinist view, it's not even about belief anymore. It's about what God decided, right? It's not a matter of, oh, if you believe you're saved, which I don't understand why an entire existence would be predicated merely upon a single docetic belief. But, you know, what, in your view, what do you think the point is for God then? Depends on what perspective you're looking at it at. We might say, yeah, it's pointless if we've got it all figured out, but yet we would exercise that same pointlessness all the time. How many kids have gone through school and done the little volcano baking soda exercise? And the teacher knows exactly what's going to happen. When we mix these ingredients, this is what will happen. And yet everyone experiences joy and we all like it. And we're like, oh, we learned something. This is really cool. And it's not that God learns things, but from God's perspective, Knowing how it's going to turn out is not diminishing how he's decided to give himself glory. It's like me going to my coffee pot in the morning. I know that when I put the pot in, press the button, I'm going to get a cup of coffee and I'm going to enjoy it. But knowing that's what's going to happen does not decrease the enjoyment for me. And the Westminster Catechism says the chief end of man is to enjoy God and glorify him forever. The whole point is God created us to glorify him. He can know the outcome and still be glorified because he's God and he decides what glorifies himself. And he knows what he enjoys, not me. If that's the case, then why does he just doesn't reveal himself to us? If there's no big secret to be had, if he already knows the outcome and he's revealed himself to people thousands of years ago, according to biblical, biblical literalists who thinks that God did do this with Job, God did this with Enoch, and God did this with Moses and all the big players of the Bible, God actually in some way communicated with them, if not even face to face, so to speak, like a man talked to a man. How come he doesn't do that now? Because most of us, I'm sure you're familiar with Schellenberg's defined hiddenness argument that as a non-resistant non-believer, we're cool with that. We're like, hey, show up. Hey, I, I would like to know. I like to know things. God knows things. I like to know things. I like epistemology. But sure. we don't see God doing that. Like I said, one of the one of the things that drew me to presuppositionalism is God refuses to put himself in the courtroom. He remains on the judge's chair. And when God says, I gave you all these examples in the Old Testament, and all those people that God appeared to there are going to be Old Testament examples. And then we're going to have Jesus entering history as a man. And then God gives us his word, which the Bible claims that it's, it's the inspired and errant word of God. And so we've got this. We've got God's word. We've got the Holy Spirit that indwells believers. We've got Jesus Christ entering history. We've got 
witnesses to this historical miracles of the past. And then, of course, Romans 1, God says that creation is evidence enough of his existence that we are all held responsible if we don't believe and repent on. If we don't repent and come to God because of seeing creation, Romans 1 says that we're held responsible for that. So in God's point of view, he has revealed himself as much as he needs to, and he is not interested in doing any more than what he's done. That, would you agree, though, even in Romans 1, and I think it's Romans 1, 18 to 22? I'm not a biblical person, man. I, I know sure. my limitations, right? I really do. Sure, uh, so I don't quote scripture. I know what's in the Bible, but I don't do well with the um, actual chapter verses. But wouldn't you say it's a little bit circular? Because an atheist can do the same thing when it comes to science. Say, look, we have evidence of the Big Bang, right? Which we do. We have evidence that it, the universe has been going on for 13.9 billion years, and the Apologists would say that's circular, but it's really not because that's not even how science works. It's more like a modus tollens than a modus ponens for science. It uh, tries to disconfirm. But the evidence, right, that we have would be congruent with what we expect with an old universe, right? Now, that doesn't preclude necessarily, necessarily that God doesn't exist or anything like that. We can't exclude that. You can't say, oh, look, the universe has been around 13.9 years, therefore there's no God. That would be fallacious. But if you're arguing that Romans is saying, because there's creation, because there's something other than nothing that proves God exists, or at least indicating that God exists, the rationalist, which are, I, I hate to include a lot of atheists in that because a lot of atheists are not rational, but the, the good ones are. Right. My, my live chat, they're good atheists. They're the rational, smart ones. They're not the ones you're yeah. used to with the godless engineers. They would argue, well, that same evidence, abductively, is evidence for the Big Bang. How, how would you differentiate between the two? The evidence is being interpreted the way it's being interpreted. And some people interpret that to be evidence for the Big Bang. Some people interpret that to be evidence for creation. And when God says he did creation, Adam and Eve were both made as adults, adult humans. And so the appearance of age in the universe is not really an issue for a young earth creationist if God's made things with the appearance of age before. But that wasn't, there's a difference though. When he created Adam and Eve, that wasn't to deceive people, right? If he created the universe with the appearance of age, which by the way, a lot of younger creationists have try to go down that route, but other ones have admonished them, that's called the Ophalus hypothesis, or last Tuesdayism, or last Wednesdayism, and that creationists have actually argued that can't be true, because if that was true, it would make God a deceiver, because he's saying one thing, hey, it's, we have the appearance of age, but he's deceiving you to make it look older, because I don't know if you're familiar with the, like, the rates study, have you read the rates study from Younger Creationism? Rates Project? Okay, so the rates Project uh, the too long didn't read version was them to understand radiometric decay and to see how radiological dating is flawed by assuming something called accelerated decay. By the way, my background was in nuclear field a little bit, so I have a little bit of an understanding of it. But um, I had talked to some of the people involved in this, including Dr. Humphreys, who was involved with the rate study, and his argument was basically this: he was like a presupper. He told me. Accelerated decay has to exist because there could be no other way because God says so. And that's not a scientific argument, right? That And, and if his supposition that uh, accelerated decay, decay was a thing, it produced excessive amount of heat. It's called the heat problem, if you want to look it up in Younger Creationism. It is unresolved. It is one of the major things in Younger Creationism that is unresolved. They have not figured this out, the heat problem, because if you have to account for millions and millions, if not billions of years of radiological decay, in a matter of six to seven thousand years, which would produce a phenomenal amount of, of heat, it would liquefy the mantle. Literally, they've done they've done the mathematics. You can go look it up. This is not an atheist or creationist. This is pretty well ubiquitous. They all agree on this. The heat problem says it would cause the mantle of the Earth to liquefy, be so hot. Right. So they they have to solve this problem, right? And so when you're talking about what evidence best suits a particular position, the atheist, the ones that are saying, oh. The Earth is billions of years old. The universe is billions of years old. We don't have to resolve that heat problem, right? Because there's no problem for us. The creationist sure. has that, that problem. And so, yes, I do understand when you say that what best suits the data case based upon our particular perspectives. But when you have something so conflicting where you have to create a whole new type of physics to, to fit your, your belief, does it, don't you find that a little bit odd? Not really. There's problems everybody has to deal with. But God said, let there be light and didn't create the sun and the moon till later. You want to talk about problems in that theory. Like God's, the whole point of creation was that it was a miraculous event. This is not something that happens every day. And so God solving a heat problem with a miracle jives really well with the Christian viewpoint. And I think that, but to come at this from an evolutionary standpoint already, and that's where the precepts guy is going to come in, where I would come in, I would say, wait a minute. 
you're saying you can predict things through this decay. You can look at a pattern and predict what it's going to do. Doesn't that sort of disprove your randomized evolution theory right there? The fact that you're predicting patterns of things that are happening when you're saying that our universe came from random evolution, because if it's random evolution, then, the, then you should be able to predict anything because it's all been random as we've come along. And now you're saying, wait a minute, we can go back and we can predict it. Can you or can you not? Both sides are going to have a problem. And for the Christian, we get to deal with that. Be saying, hey, God's the all-powerful being. He even made light before he made the sun. He did a miracle. And so we're going to solve our heat problem with a cooling miracle. There's a few things that I, I think I, I have to like interject on that particular uh, thing that you just said. There's a few errors I think you, you, you ran into. Sure. One, before I even do that, if God has to create all these miracles to fix everything, he maybe should just created the universe to where it made sense to begin with. Again, what you're suggesting, something I actually already suggested, his name was, by the way, was named Robert Gentry, Dr. Robert Gentry. And he had a long time ago, these things called God's Little Mysteries. And they were called hal pl plechloric or hal halos, radiometric halos, that basically he said, demonstrated the earth was formed over a period of few weeks. He didn't argue that it was produced young, but he argued that the earth was created very quickly in a matter of a few weeks. And when it came out later, we understood why that process did make it appear that that's what it was. We understood how the physics actually worked. Then he threw in what you just did. He's called them singularities, a one time off where God just did these minor miracles to fix the sun. These are very ad hoc explanations, though. First of all, we have an explanation that shows why these halos exist based upon our understanding of physics, which work. But you're our, but not you, but Gentry was like, yeah, you know what? That does make sense. We're going to go with that. But you know what? We're just going to say it's a miracle that God, as a singularity, a one off event, decided to intervene um but as far as the randomness um first i mean you, uh, you do know that evolution is um uh, not random right there's no random this when it comes to natural selection there is a determinate system for that and sure, second of all as a, as a process tends to be a very randomized process no it's not it's actually non-random i mean it's actually directed in some ways because it's based upon selective pressures through right i mean if i if i have some kind of genetic trait that's going to be selected for it that's not random. That's the, the physics is going to base, you know, be, be uh, influenced, influence that that creature in order to survive more, so it can procreate more. So it's there's not a sense of randomness. When I hear the word randomness, and let me ask you what you mean by it, random in statistics is stochastic, meaning that to us we don't know what the outcome is going to be. But in quantum mechanics, true randomness means that there is no information available in sure. order to determine something like weak nuclear decay, spontaneous fission. Those are, by definition, as random as you can get. There, I don't think there's anything else in the universe that could be more random than that because there's nothing in the system to determine when that particular atom is going to decay or when that particular nucleon is going to go and go weak nuclear decay for like beta decay. Nothing is ever going to be able to determine that. You can't say, hey, Joseph, I'll bet you 10 bucks that this particular atom is going to decay at a certain amount of time. It would just be pure luck if you won. But what we can say is that if we have a kilogram of a particular material based upon the decay rate, let's say the decay rate of half-life is 10 years, we'll say that, oh, okay, we know that in 10 years, half that material will be gone. We do know that. It's going to happen every single time without fail. We just can't tell you which atoms of those original amount will be left and which ones sure. won't. Okay. That, that's where the randomness comes in. But we do know. Well, I'm talking about randomness. When I'm talking about randomness, so let me present two sides of the sure. randomness. Step one, we have a Big Bang and wham, we've got an inhabitable planet with some life on it that's going to evolve. The chances of that happening statistically are pretty insane. And the fact of nothing exploding into something is also a random deal. So there's not a lot of things we can do to predict how this is going to work out or how many bangs we need to create a universe where everything's got room for life. And so I guess that's going to lean into the fine tuning argument at some point. Um, but the, when we talk about randomness and evolution, you've got a lot of random things the evolutionists haven't figured out how to explain. Uh, for instance, uh, why do humans have sex? If, if the best form of reproduction was a single cell asexually duplicating itself, which is what it had to be in the beginning, was when we're just duplicating and then slowly modifying, why would we all of a sudden create a very non-efficient process? If our whole goal is survival and these pressures help us survive better and better, why would we come up with a process such as sexual intercourse to uh, have reproduction when we could just have the cells asexually duplicating themselves? There's like random things like that where we're like, that actually doesn't fit our flow if our whole goal is to survive and do well. And that's what evolution is gearing us for. Why did it come up with these little oddities that really actually seem to take us a step back? Because they, they actually don't. And it's based upon the fact that because these species had such selective pressures that existed and only operate on existing conditions. 
evolutionary pressures can only change things that exist. You can't just make, you just can't say, oh, I want this to appear. Things that um, are beneficial to the organism more makes that organism more likely to procreate, makes the species more likely to procreate. Evolution only acts on, acts on a population. It doesn't act on an individual. An organism cannot evolve. A population evolved. And so, okay, but a population we, is made up of... But when, yeah, but you, do, you realize that single cell organisms became multicellular at some point, especially through endosymbiosis, when sure. you had some kind of bacterium or something along those lines that became part of the cell. And this is why we still have what's called the mitochondrial matrix. The mitochondrial part of the cell produces the ATP. Lots of ATP, which is in animals, as a multicellular animal, we wouldn't exist if that never happened because we wouldn't have the energy to, to be able to do all the things that we do, right? For the adenosine triphosphate, we wouldn't be able to have anywhere near that. So as that changed, biological reproduction changed as well. I'm not a biologist, but I'll get one to come on and talk about that. I, but okay. I, but what, what? I just want to ask you, though, you talk about the Big Bang you do you realize there's no bang right the, the big bang is a misnomer there's never anything yeah. banging right there's another yeah. there's no explosion right right okay because a lot yeah. of, some people don't it's just like, it's, yeah we call it the big bang but that completely was a misnomer yeah. I, I, um, I understand you, can, you can't explode into something that doesn't exist there's no container the, for it to explode in there's no explosion. sure but the statistical probability of all these mutations working out to to where we are today is mathematically uh, largely improbable no, and, and i'm also one. gonna it's one because it ex it did and just because something is improbable doesn't mean it's not possible. If you take a deck of cards, right? No, but when we put a 13.9 billion year process in there and then we start rolling the dice to see if it's going to work out, uh, it actually does. It, I think that lends credibility to the creationist side that there was a God directing it. If you look at the two options of this is going to happen randomly over 13.9 billion years or a someone is going to design the system, the designed system has more credibility than the atheists are going to give to it. And to your point, and, and I really am going to have to say red flag there. Okay. Evolution doesn't happen to individuals. It happens to populations. Populations are made up of individuals. That's just logical. Yeah, but that's the fallacy of, of decomposition, right? It, it's because something happens to the whole doesn't mean it happens to the individual. That's a fallacy. Literally yeah, a fallacy. but if it's not happening to individuals, it can't happen to the whole, man. Correct. No, no, it can. It, the whole consists of the of everything, right? It, it, I, can, I, I can experience things that my individual cells can't experience, right? Unless sure. you get some kind of panpsychism or something. Sure. But, but your fallacy of decomposition is basically saying that as a whole, as a population, that's doing some evolving. Now, the individuals are changing. That is true. You can't have you can't have a change of the whole without some change of the internal structure, the, what's called the primitives. And so that is true. But those individuals do not go through what's called evolution. They do not evolve. They do change. But the, the technical explanation for evolution is a change of allelic frequency in a given population of species over a period of time from one generation to the next generation or through hereditary traits. This would be, by definition, preclude anything below the species level as far as the individual organism. And, and this is one thing that you really have to look at when you look at these species, how they change. They go through what's called allopatric, sympatric, peripatric, and pedopatric speciation. And I probably butchered those because I haven't looked at them in a long time. Sure. But these speciation events allow for these species to fundamentally change their morphology, change their physiology. And that's really what's happening is that on the genetic level, you have these changes of alleles, these genes that have been mutated for some reason, whether it be by radiation or be by spontaneous, or they have a, what's called an SNP, uh, SNP, they change. And so that produces some kind of phenotype change that the surrounding environment can act upon. And that's what it's selected for. It's selecting for those species that have the genetic fitness that causes some kind of phenotype to be where that's going to benefit the species as a whole. So yeah, it's not that the, the individual organisms don't change, they do because they're the ones that have the genes that change, the change okay. of the like frequency, but they're not evolving. It is the population that evolves. So you have to you have to be careful between the term evolve and just merely change. They're not the same thing. Sure, sure, that's fair. Okay. I have about 10 minutes left and you can tell me how you want to spend them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. by the way, we're gonna do a part. I, I had asked you if you want to do a philosophy first <laughs> and I, I, I did a vote to this by the way. And I think 42% said biology first, 38% philosophy first, and then the rest were like mix and which we're kind of doing. But we, I do want to get more specific into biology maybe next time. But sure. I, I, cause I do I do love the philosophical aspect. I, um, I, I personally think there's only a handful of possible explanations. And let me run them by you. When it comes to the universe and existence, why there's something sure. other than nothing, for so to speak. 
you either have a infinite causal chain of regression. We'll call it infinite regress. Okay. You have some kind of brute fact that exists that's contingent from which all things contingent flow. I would hope to think that you and I are contingent beings, right? We're not arrogant to think we're necessary, right? Right. Okay. Right. And then, of course, a necessary being. And then the Christians would argue the necessary being is God. So this is a category error that I think Arn Rock kept making when I did an analysis in one of his videos. He thought the necessary being had to imply a God, which is a Muslim argument, by the way. It is, Islam does argue that. But he didn't recognize that you can have a being that is necessary. That could be a quantum fluctuation. That could be something that has to exist. A Higgs field could be a necessary being. Something that has to exist. But why? Who knows? That's the problem. We don't know why there has to be a necessary being if that's the route you want to take. But for me, there are only three options. It's, to me, it's, a, it's a pretty much a trilemma. And, and this is, goes to the argument contingency, basically. But you have an infinite regress, something contingent that, that all things come from, or a necessary being. And you would probably argue then that it's a necessary being. And from that, argue that necessary being has to be God. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this is where maybe you should have a good conversation with your buddy Floyd, because he refused to engage on where everything came from. And I think that's where we have to start is where did everything come from and looking at what are our options and how are we going to get to where we are now from those options and how we're going to do it. Oh, yeah, I've, I've had this discussion with Floyd. I, look, I, I, like I said, I get along with Floyd. Amazing. It's just the problem that you run into, I think, isn't even from a physics standpoint, it's from an epistemological standpoint. And that is where does our limit in knowledge where's that wall we have to hit an epistemic wall we're, we're not infinite in knowledge there has to be a concrete limit to our understanding of our universe that we can apprehend and so even if it's an infinite regress i i see a lot of atheists go oh, you can't have an infinite regress or christians even argue that it's, yes you can there's nothing illogical about infinite regress it it's it doesn't make much sense to us because we have a hard time conceptualizing it's logical infinity. but not as plausible as some of the other ones and that's okay like i said <laughs> I, I to me all three of them suck to be honest with you all three of them do not explain anything. They don't satisfy PSR, which I do not hold to. I don't even hold to the weak PSR because I do think Oppy proved, Press and a friend of mine named Joseph Rasmussen, uh, Dr. Ra Rasmussen, he doesn't pronounce his name, that even the weak PSR will collapse into the strong PSR. So I don't hold to any kind of principle of reason. But all three options are bad options because why is there an infinite regress? Why is there something contingent? We we'll call that a brute fact. And why is there something necessary? None of them explain anything. Just positing God, I would argue to you with the last few minutes, and then you can have a rebuttal. Positing God still doesn't explain anything. It doesn't explain why he created what he did. It doesn't explain why he did what he did. It doesn't explain why he actualized this particular world over any other. It doesn't explain why I stubbed my toe 55 times in my lifetime as opposed to 54, like what I have to gain from that. Why is this exact universe in reality that we live in the one that was actualized? It doesn't explain anything. It's ad hoc to me when people say, oh, because of God. Because, okay, unless you can ask God directly these questions, directly, like you and having a conversation, mm -hmm. and even then, would you really understand his answers? Because you're dealing with something that supposedly is an infinite consciousness, an infinite mind trying to make a limited mind apprehend something. So I just think that these questions are basically unanswerable at the time. And I think a lot of Christians, and I'm, I'm not trying to demean you by any means of this, but I think a lot of Christians just assert these things as, oh, it has to be a God, and then try to run some kind of argument, which is fine. They're allowed to do that as to why, or in your case, you just presuppose it. You 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 avoid the classical and you avoid the ontological arguments, the cosmological arguments, the rationalism. You just like, look, I'm going to presuppose God, which, by the way, I don't have a problem with. I, I don't. A lot of atheists think it's dishonest. It's not. It's called reformed epistemology. It's by Plantinga. I could understand where they're coming from in it. I just don't accept it. Because I don't think I'm going to change as a person if God doesn't exist. Logic's not going to change. X does not stop being X if God didn't exist. I'm not going to be an immoral person if God vanished, right? I don't need morality to, 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 to be given to me by some mind that tells me what, what is moral, what I should and should not do, when I can just figure that out on my own. Okay, except yeah. for the morality argument. All right, all right. We'll have to get next, it to another time. Another time. That's fair enough. That was launching into that. I'll give you that. Except give for that. what you just said about morality, I agreed with everything you said. And I think uh, that's partly why I'm pre-sub. I think anybody that – I don't think this explains why God did anything. And I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning, which is I think we put God in too small of a box. And I think that is part of how God refuses to be put in the courtroom. He refuses to be judged by man. He refuses to give us those answers that we're looking for. He refuses to come off of his judge's bench to let us examine him. And I think that's just part of who God is. He's a, as a very secure being. He doesn't feel the need to explain himself to these creatures. And everyone in the Bible who got an opportunity 
to talk to God and ask these questions did not like his answers. And if they did, they came away being like, whoa, I'm sorry I ever no, asked. You're probably so, right. No, you're, I'll, and I'll tell you what, reciprocity. Yeah. I'll grant you that as well. <laughs> I think you're probably right. I think we may not want to know the answers to some of this stuff. I think when yeah. you do come into contact with this being, all of a sudden you realize that we were – we were on the whole wrong track the whole time. We completely missed the issue. If you come into exist, if you come into contact with the being of the Bible, you aren't the one asking questions. I, I, and I, I, whether I think you, that's fairly even on. I, I, whether I agree you believe that. he exists or not, if yeah. he does, and you met him, you ain't talking. And so, uh, for me, and the, and the reason I even do this stuff, and I guess I get my little one minute plug, and uh, that is just the oh, one sorry. thing that we do understand is that this God, the mind blowing, scandalous event of the Bible, is that this God sent his son, a uh, full member of the Trinity, to die on the cross and atone for our sins, which makes zero sense. If he is who he says he is and we are who he says we are, uh, there is no reason at all that God should set his love and affection on us and show us a way to be reconciled to himself after we have sinned and been uh, rebellious to him in our flesh and done things like asking questions of him. Those are all things that would be unforgivable in his court. And so my, my goal is to tell people about this Jesus that did die for our sins and offers us a path to reconciliation with this being. And you're right. I can't give you the answer. Why did God do that? Because I don't know. And only he could tell us, and he's probably not going to. And he's probably not going to give us that light flash revel revelation that everybody says, well, God did this, I'd believe him. Maybe what wouldn't. God says that even if some Somebody comes back from the dead they still won't believe it's a hard thing that he has to do but my goal in all this is not to make a defense for god that he doesn't make for himself this is simply what i believe and the part of that i think is important is not pascal's wager but i do believe we're eternal beings and we'll spend eternity somewhere and the only way for that to be enjoyable is if that i put my hope trust and faith in christ alone for my salvation Oh, that's fair enough. I put a picture link to your video just, uh, channel to the link below. So guys, go subscribe to him. I'm sure he's uh, open to ask, being asked questions. And yeah, so I'm going to have you back on because you did promise me too. I don't know. Maybe we'll do biology. I don't know. I, you're slipping in the irresistible grace and all that kind of stuff at the very end there. So maybe we, we can get Floyd on and maybe do some of that kind of stuff. But anyways, dude, I seriously thank you for coming on. I love these types of discussions. They're not adversarial, yeah. and I enjoy them far more than debates. If you want to watch debates, go to Modern Day Debate. He has a great channel over there that yeah. kind of took debate stuff and ran with it, and he's doing an amazing job. If you want to watch debates, this channel is going to be more about discussions. I think the debates, for me personally, are a little more uh, older. I've done them. Personally, I don't think I've ever lost a debate. Some people may argue, but whatever. I mean... I appreciate your very non-hostile approach to this. This is probably the best <laughs> conversation I've had. You're one of the ones I'm like, yeah, I could do this again with him. This was a good chat. Like, it'd be cooler if we were in person and we could have cigars and some whiskey oh, together. I, this is what it is. I, I stopped smoking cigars because I quit smoking 25 years ago, but scotch, I'm on it. Okay. So anyways, I thank you, man. I appreciate it. I'm going to end the uh, stream yards. I say it ends here to my live chat, but we'll get you going. Thank you. I'll reach out to you again, and we'll figure out the next date. But I want to thank you for coming on. Go check out. I must say, I'm, I know I'm going to butcher this. Gospelonian? Gospelogian. Gospelogian. It's Gospelogian. A, there we go. Gospelogian. Act of theologian and gospel. Gospelogian. Gospelogian. All right. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it, man. We'll catch you later and see you guys later. All right, guys. I'm going to wrap this up. I want to thank you guys for being members to the, the chat. I want to thank my mods and I want to thank the rest of you out there for supporting the Non Secretary Show. Just to add on, there are, there are things coming, happening right now in a legal sense. I might see an actual payment from Kyle uh, starting maybe next month. So huge news on that. I'm not going to get into the details as to why, but hopefully I think he wants to start paying it off and I'm cool with that. We were in the process of doing some legal things to ascertain some properties and other things, but we don't have to go through that now if he's willing to work with us. And I think that he is. So kudos to him on that, but hopefully we'll get my first payment sometime next month. And with that, guys, thanks for watching the Non Sequitur Show. Thanks for becoming members. Thanks for liking, subscribing to the channel, sharing them. And if you've got any comments, leave them in the video section, and I will get to them as soon as I can. With that, good night.